How you doing, guys? I'm going to talk to you about chip tunes. You guys like chip tunes? Yeah. All right, they are awesome. See, this slide is amazing. I'm going to tell you about myself. I'm Professor Dan Cannon, and you're looking through my wonderful world of chip tunes. Who is this guy? That's actually me. I'm a game more wizard, a guitar wizard, I am a wizard. I'm actually playing with Metroid Bells now. I play a uh, pretty mean guitar. Um, oh, yeah. I also do some guitar. Anyways, I'm just going to get started with a little bit of history, because um, I think it's important. It's not my biggest specialty, but I think it's, it's I really need a little background information. So, what is a chip tune? Essentially, you take the old chips of old antiquated video game consoles and you turn it into a musical instrument. Um, it could be anything from like a Commodore 64 uh, all the way up to a Super NES or Genesis. After that, um, unfortunately, they started using more realistic sound, which is awesome for game music, but they had a little bit less, or a lot less character to them. So, uh, the old sounds, I know we kind of go back and keep using them today because they sound very awesome and they have a lot of character to them. So this last thing here, um, I have a Mario that we're going to talk about that. It's too far. Yeah, it is, actually. Okay. Mario that we're going is essentially what journalists say when they don't know anything yeah, like about the things both of them? and they try to report about it. Yeah, it's maybe over there. I'm going to try that. That's why I'm giving this panel. Because there is a lot of depth to it. That's why I fell in love with it. I am in love with chiptunes. And, you know, I was just a guitar player playing in bands for years, and then about two years ago, I just got super into this scene. So, there's a lot of depth to chiptunes. I'm going to try to fill you in a little bit so, you know, you can enjoy it the same way that I do. So, a little history. Obviously, chiptunes start with old video games. In fact, the first game to have background music is uh, a little friend here which is the uh, Space Invaders. And I'm actually going to play the music of Space Invaders, and you're going to see how riveting it is. Incredible. <laughs> so, um, it's, actually, I do want to make a aside on that, so it had like that descending burr, 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 burr. So it got faster as the game progressed, and it in its own creepy way, it's sort of immersive. Um, so I give it some props. Oh my god, nothing against Space Invaders. And it was the first game of background music. Um, and that was for arcade games. And the arcade games in the late 70s started to get integrated circuits and uh, dedicated logic for sound. And they started to come up with cool music on these little sound chips. In fact, you might think that chip is kind of a new thing. I mean, I didn't hear about it until like five years ago. Um, but the first two tune album was actually made in 1984 by this guy who he was in this old band called Yellow Magic Orchestra. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah. Okay, they're like this really original gangster electronic. Um, yeah, so apparently electronic music can be OG. <laughs> but uh, he sampled all, all the old Namco arcade games and he actually put together an album out of it. And uh, it's funny to think, Chip Two is literally, there's been albums that have been made for the last 28 years. So it's not a new concept whatsoever. Uh, the last point I have on this slide is the demo scene. By the way, just on the side, I totally didn't start anything very well, but um, if any of you have any questions, there are some concepts I'm going to go over that are a little bit complex. And so if you want to know more about something, just let me know. Good. So the next thing we're going on to is another complex topic is the demo scene. And the demo scene is amazing. Essentially, you have like all these crazy hacking uh, programmers who are literally like those guys you see on bad movies like Hackers. And uh, what they did is they totally tried to make the most complex, awesome graphics that could be made on a system. Like they were doing like 3D rendering on a Commodore 64, and which is the most backward, stupid thing you could ever think of. And what they would do is, instead of actually you know, rendering out 3D lighting and everything, what they do is they would use tricks and illusions to make it look like that. And they were just the cleverest, awesome programmers. And so anyways, they, they made these awesome things called demos. They had parties in Europe, and they were all European about it. <laughs> that's, that's a thing. And uh, they started to include music, and they would rip the music from games, and they would kind of make it into a music video graphics. Stuff. And 
then they started to write their own tools to make music. Because the old tools to make game music back in the day are the worst piece of crap ever. You know, now you open up Fruit Loops and you got your step sequencer and your piano roll and oh, this is intuitive and great. But back in the day, they, they really did not have any tools and that demo scene actually started to write some of the tools to hack into these. So, um, has anybody here downloaded any illegal software ever? No. Okay, okay, good. So this will go completely over your head. Um, you ever like open up the key jam and this awesome like jet, this awesome jam is playing and you're like, yeah, I totally am breaking into this software. <laughs> no. Well, um, you know, a lot of that's old chiptune music and so a lot of people actually refer to chiptunes as key jam music. I've seen that on a bunch of like, YouTube comments and stuff like, oh, sweet key jam jam. And it's like, Oh, yeah. No, one of the reasons that um, you actually have the keygen music attached to the keygens is because initially when you would be trading in these cracks, you would have, uh, you'd have like a floppy disk, right? So the, the, the crack or the key would be X amount of bytes and you'd have so much left over. And these warehouse guys, they were so interested in a consolidation of space that they'd be like, well, we got this extra space, what are we going to do? We might as well like, write a jam for it. <laughs> That's what I would do. So, um, Demo scene philosophy and how it relates to chiptunes. All right, so I'm gonna get a little bit like uh, out there and spacey, but the idea behind the demo scene was to take a piece of hardware and go way beyond any preconceived notions of what I could do, and like essentially just like pimp my ride on my like, Commodore 64 or something. Like they created art within restraints, and that's kind of a, a concept that really transfers over to chiptunes a lot, and. When you have a Game Boy or an NES and you're making music on it, it is actually an extremely limited musical platform. There's like lots of things you cannot do. There's more things you can't do than what you can do. But um, they have so much character that you can kind of coax some awesome things about it. So the other thing about demos and stuff, they'd have parties and they'd share them together. And they'd be like, oh my god, I can't believe they got that sort of sound out of, or not sound, but that sort of video effect out of you know, some old system. And there's art into the programming and not just the final product. Like, that's the cool thing about chiptunes is, you know, you, there's art you can see. Like, there's, there's this complexity in the programming and getting around all of these limitations that you have. And it parallels the demo scene perfectly. And so they kind of go hand in hand. I think it's important to cover them. So I actually want to play you a demo. It's a Game Boy demo. So uh, you can kind of see what it is and what they do. So imagine if you saw these graphics on your uh, on the Game Boy game, and also there's a sweet uh, background track played by uh, Nordlet. So this is actually playing on the uh, the end. Of
from the main ones. So they, they all have their own character to them. And I'm going to show you, hopefully you can kind of hear like, oh, that that, that that one. Uh, the first one is the NES, which is a 2A03, I say 2A03. And uh, let's check, check out a track.
ridiculous. I can't even talk about it because I'm in legal, legal discussion with them. Well, I'm telling you, they do. That's not right on legal. Look at my faces. I don't know who their faces are. Right. The hell I'm wrong with them. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Right. It's going to be a video game. <laughs> So that was actually Tim Bolin talking, because he stole a track from the Finnish chiptune artist and just put it in his Nelly Cortado song. Yeah, he, he, he was like, I sampled it, but he just literally stole the entire song and put it from me underneath it. Give yourself space and thinking Pro Tools. This guy's trolling me over here. <laughs> but uh, no, it's a crazy story. Like, he, he must have thought no one would have noticed or something, but he found a sweet jam on a like, European uh, demo, demo site, and he literally just stole it, and he was like, oh, I didn't know who was by, and it's like, sampling is different. I mean, you guys know what the Amen break is? So, like, that's the most sampled thing in history, but it's maybe three seconds worth of music, maybe five seconds, and they cut it up, and they turned it into something completely new. Meanwhile, he just took the song and turned it into his song, and he's like, I'm sweet, I'm Timbaland. I'm like, no, you're not. So, that was a big controversy with the uh, music, and uh, it was kind of fun to actually watch that unfold, but um, I'm pretty sure the guy who wrote that song actually got a lot of money. So, yay, chorus! <laughs> um, one thing at the end, do you guys like general video? No one. I love that. Thank you. Um, general video is not considered chip tune, it is a MIDI file that contains no information describing the synthesis of the instrument. Does that make any sense to anybody? And pretty much, you know, when I program a note into a tracker to make music, I also are am choosing like certain properties of the synthesizer to make it do certain things, whether I'm choosing uh, like the width of the pulse wave or something like that. Meanwhile, MIDI is really just notes um, and just data. And uh, just two music is a little bit more than that. I've got nothing against general MIDI, I love it. I love Canyon Death MIDI. <laughs> Clouds.mid. <laughs> so uh, let's move on a little bit. You're talking about the character of chip tunes. And so Game Boy and NES, they have uh, three channels plus white notes, and they can only play one note at a time. And so what does that mean? Only three notes can ever be playing at once, which is crazy. Like, if I gave you a keyboard and be like, no, you can only play three at one time, you'd be like, what the hell? I can't really make anything good out of this. But they use a lot of tricks. Uh, like, they will arpeggiate a note instead of uh, a major chord, they'll go da da da, and then they'll just do it super fast. And it actually makes um, it sound like a chord, and they use an illusion to make it sound like a full chord is playing even though they're only playing one note at a time. And uh, that's sort of like the demo scene where they use a lot of illusions to get 3D effects and stuff like that. So, you know, you only have a few timbers, or timbers, I should never do that again. <laughs> uh, you only have a few timbres you can do, but uh, you can cycle through them very fast, and they all have just enough character to make a really robust instrument. So, uh, the most iconic chip sounds are essentially the creative workarounds, like I said, the arpeggio, and uh, also you do things called uh, channel economy, where you try to fit more in there. Um, and you also do a little uh, human humanization to make it not sound like a robot. Because of these limitations, though, uh, that's what gives it the character. And that's why there's these iconic chip sounds that you hear. And that's, this is why chip music is instantly identifiable. You can hear it like, oh, that's a chip tune. Um, and the other thing is, people aren't doing these now on other instruments because they would be extremely laborious to program. Like, if I'm doing left, right, panning, switching over each millisecond, and then cycling through a 12 note arpeggio, like, if I was to do that on a piano roll, that would take like an hour to just do one chord. And Game Boy and NES stuff, like they really lend themselves to some of these complex things. And so what it can do, we do really well. And we take advantage of all of these things, we exploit them. And we, as a result, have a very original sound and a cool sound platform. It's like a very original synthesizer that's like weirdly broken. But I don't know, maybe it's like those old cameras that people love and they have like pinhole effects and stuff like that, but people, they're super sought after because, you know, people want something that has character to it. So why do people like chip tunes? Does this look like anybody you know? 
No? Okay. Uh, nostalgia is a big thing. And I know that I listen to old video game songs. I've literally played two bands that play old video game songs. So I regularly go back and listen to the old music and stuff like that. And when you become a fan of that, it really, um, I don't know where I'm going with that. Where are we going with that, Jim? No. Talk about that. <laughs> so Chip is right now. He's in an interesting, interesting position. Uh, Peter Swim from uh, True Ship Till Death, which is a chip blog, uh, came up with this really great uh, like concept for us. It's three types of chip tunes. And basically it's that uh, chip tune people, fans at this point, are either from three different camps. There's people who like the old video game music, and they like the old video game sound. And that's kind of just nostalgia chip tune by people that are and then there's the um, there's sort of the old clock remix people, and those are the guys that like the old music but not necessarily the 8 bit sound. But, so they want to remix these into you know, huge orchestral versions, and that's awesome too. Then there's modern children, which is people who like the, um, the, the 8 bit sound but not necessarily the music, and so they're trying to make it into the records. So that seems really interesting, interesting because it's kind of this weird overlap with these very really distinct types of people. Like all very well said, James. By the way, James is uh, part of a group called Fred Conway. They played earlier today, too, and you missed them, too. Not that, uh, I, I'm just going to treat my crowd like shit. Okay? <laughs> but uh, the other thing I like is you have this extreme level of control over your compositions. Like, I can really get into the degree and head it to the millisecond of what's going on. And it's, uh, Shacker is kind of a, a nice platform to do that sort of Extreme level of control, so I love that. Um, one other thing is, Chiptune has this big punk DIY, you know, cyberpunk ethic going with it. Uh, one of the coolest things I ever saw was outside of Hatch Prime in 09, there was a concert going on on the sidewalk, and they had an amplifier hooked up to a car battery, and they were having a Chiptune dance party. It was amazing. It was the most popular thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. And what was cool was Max loved it. They were like, all right. This is, we're not shutting you down at all, this is fantastic. Um, but it definitely has that punk time to it. So, I don't know, the punk culture is very cool. It's very, I don't know, how is punk? Pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> but the other thing is, all of these are valid reasons. You don't have to, there isn't a certain way that you have to come from to like chip music, but all of these are good reasons. So the other thing is, chip is not a genre. Sort of like guitar music, and music is not a genre, but you know, you can really make a million types of genres out of guitar, piano, and chip tune. And you should really consider these chips as synthesizers. And any genre you can think of, and a bunch you can, are from a chip. I'm actually going to play a couple different genres just to show you the variety of things that are out there. This is a jazz track. Huge club production track. 
and I love that huge sound. As soon as I heard someone make a huge sound out of the keyboard, I was like, all right, yeah, I can do this. Because I'm a big production more, and uh, I do recording and stuff, and I was surprised on how powerful an instrument and how huge and awesome it sounds. I've had people come up to me and be like, I want to get that sound out of my synthesizer, and I have no idea how you made it. And it's, I don't know, it's a cool, original thing. Um, some people actually make, uh, going back into the genre, some people actually make music to sound like old NES music, which is totally cool too. I love it because I'm a band guy, 
like having a band make show up to practice is the worst thing ever. You know, you dealt with that. But you get to do everything yourself. You get to program the wrong. You get to do the bass and guitar, and you can practice when you want to practice. So you can, don't have to be in the mood. And I love just being able to do everything myself. The other cool thing is it's super inexpensive to get into this. Like if you're gonna download a program called Family Tracker, which is make, makes NES music, it's free. You can just download it today and start making chip music. Uh, the program I use on the Game Boy is called LSDJ. It's two dollars for that. And you can go on eBay and go. Well, first you could play it on an emulator, and that's free. Or you could go on eBay and buy a Game Boy for twenty dollars or something. Like my guitar costs twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> like and a Game Boy on uh, on eBay is just as good as like the best Game Boy ever made. Like, Michael Jackson. <laughs> Actually, Michael Jackson had a gold Game Boy that was uh, diamond crusted, and I could have bought it if I had unlimited money, but they melted it down recently. <laughs> so it no longer exists, I'm very sad about this. But, anyways, um, it's very inexpensive and also it's super portable and easy to play shows with. I, you know, brought it on the plane with me. I play here. I take the bus all the time over to New York. I live in Buffalo, it's like eight hours away. I live in Philadelphia, I take the bus. Um, and I have everything I need with me in my backpack and my guitar, and it's amazing. And the fact that I have a guitar is just extra stuff. Like, I could literally do it with, like, a fanny pack and play shows. <laughs> literally. Yeah, that, that, which is amazing to me. So, yeah, I gotta say something. What's interesting also, um, because it's so inexpensive, you see chip tune popping up in a lot of places like Indonesia, um, like Southeast Asia, where these kids are obviously they're not going to have you know three grand to throw down on some MacBook Pro to make electronic music, but they can they can find a fifteen dollar Game Boy and LSDJ cartridge, and they can be making amazing music at like the same level as anyone else in the world. So this is great, like it lowers the entry level for real artistic minded people to get involved, which I think is a massive. Yeah, essentially it's not about production value. Right? If any of you have been in a band and decided to record a demo and it sounds like shit, and you know, you try to show it to somebody and you want them to focus on the music. And what they do is they go, well, it sounds kind of poor. It doesn't sound like my Skrillex record. Um, yeah, and I spent years mastering like the art of recording and stuff like that, and now I can do stuff at that level. Before it was so frustrating. It's like, tell me what's a good song or something. And this evens the playing field. There's no version. Like, and the, the other cool thing is coming out of the Game Boy, like, it sounds big on its own. And I, it was literally when I went to go master my record, it was the easiest thing to master ever. I literally just put on like an EQ and like brought down the fader to make it louder and I was almost done. And considering what I did for my other like other bands that I recorded, were these month-long processes of like checking mixes and checking the EQ on every single instrument. It's surprisingly easy and awesome. So uh, definitely, definitely good for making music for poor people. <laughs> the other thing I have at the bottom is this. It forces you to see the matrix of music. And I started to listen to music differently after I had to compose. And I had to make a bass drum. Like, how do you make a bass drum out of this thing that only plays notes? Um, so what you would do is you would do a, a pitch slide down from a really tall, uh, like really high note, like a C8, and then down to a C3. I can I can show you how it. Yeah, no, I, I will actually show you how I make a bass drum right around right now. It's fun. Dan's been taking a tour of intrusive music. Yeah. So I already have a bass drum on my track. I'll make another one. So, isn't that a lovely note? I'm going to make a new instrument, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a table. And what a table is, is it's like a little script for that instrument. It's sort of like you compose it to like, oh, it's going to cycle through these notes, or it's going to cycle through that pattern. So, what I do is I bring it up a bunch of octaves. It's in hex, by the way, which is another nice little stumbling block if you're starting out. There is a high learning curve to this, but it's super rewarding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a pitch shift, and this will depend on tempo, but... So let's make a couple of these. Sounds lovely. But if I pitch shift it down, in fact... Yeah, 
Oh, it's ass. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, too cool for a C. 
see. <laughs> uh, anyways, anyways, um, yeah, a lot of artists do pay what you want, and if you want to support the artists, you can totally, you can totally do that, or you can just download for free in the future. Um, but it's, it's really cool because they also take a super small cut as opposed to iTunes. They don't have like a gaming community of trying to get your music on there. Because um, I have to use like a third party service to get anything on iTunes and it costs me lots of money. And then I get a small cut. Meanwhile, Bandcamp, all the money goes to the artist. Well, 90% of it. And it's a great site. So if you're not using that, definitely use it. Also, and this is something people don't think of, is uh, old video game music. You can download all of it. And I seriously learned all of my tricks from old video game music. So, like, there's this place called Kumu's NSF Archive, which is the Nintendo sound file, which has like every Nintendo game ever you can hear, every song ever made, and a lot of the <coughs> sound effects too. Um, and uh, you can also do this for NES music, and Scene.org also has a demo scene sort of stuff. But uh, check this out, this is Mega Man 3. <laughs> You guys know that one, right? I can search this in every song. And the other cool thing is I can break it down. I can separate channels. And I can do what one is doing. Oh, yeah. And it's cool to be able to do that. You can even slow it way down. And I used to use this all the time. But it also taught me the limitations of these consoles and what they could do and the tricks they used to get around it. So check this out. Yes. So this is Snake Man. <coughs> there was this cool uh, reverb effect on the like, How did you get that? Well, what they did is they had a second channel playing the exact same thing, except it's delayed and a little bit quieter, so check this out. And it sounds wrong when it's by itself, but when you put it together, you get this nice echo sound out of it. And I would seriously go and geek out about this shit all day. <laughs> and you get this nice reverb sound. And these are all the tricks that people use in chip music to get more out of their console, just to get it beyond their limitations and make it sound like so much more than the limitations you make it. Um, the other cool thing I would do is I would go through and listen to the sound. So. Okay, so that sounds stupid, right? But like, if I slow this way down, you get to hear what it's actually composed of. It's actually composed of musical notes. And that's the sound when you die in Mega Man. And it was this. Yeah, and you're like, oh my god, that's pretty cool. So, um, and then you have crazy noises like, what was that? Yeah, well, what was that? Let's let's take a listen to what that sounds like slow. Yeah, what was that? <laughs> it sounds like some aliens like raping me or something. That's that's how it looks actually. Sorry, I don't mean to be on PC and stuff, so I'm not sure. But I would go through this and this is how I learned all so many tricks and it's just a free resource. These are all free. I've downloaded every Nintendo game and found some jams that I like and learned a bunch of tricks along the way. And to me it's interesting. Like, did you know that the noise when you pick up a mushroom in Super Mario is the same melody as when we pull up the flagpole, which is da 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 Yeah, they just sped it up a thousand times and that's the noise of when you pick up the mushroom. There's all kinds of lazy bullshit that they do. So let's say you want to get started, you know, listen to the types of chips and see which appeal to you. I played a lot of different stuff and a lot of different chips and hopefully you're like, that is badass. Or that sucks. So the other thing is you need to do a lot of research. There is a bit of a learning curve getting into chip music. Um, 
but every site has like a lot of uh, tutorials and videos that you can go watch. Definitely do Google, but ask questions to people that you respect. They're like, oh, how do you get that sound? You know, learn the basics first, and then like just how to input notes and what some of the effects are, and then ask, you know, chip parts that you admire, and be like, oh, this is so cool, how to do that? And I seriously answer like one email a week about, you know, how did you do that, how did you do that? And I don't know, I love doing that. I love sharing the knowledge that I have. And uh, I still learn constantly. Like, literally, Luke from Anthony Gucci showed me something like two weeks ago. And it was funny because I was like, you can't teach me anything. I don't know. I don't know the master of this shit. And then as soon as he said what he was doing, I was like, oh, fuck, I thought of that. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's, it's a constant learning process. And I like to be like the sensei guy. And I'm just constant student. And I don't know. That's kind of cool. But uh, they have manuals. And it turns out that they're really in informative. And you should totally read them. People do not do that at all. But I went through the manual after learning LSDJ for a while. And I was like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. So the manual was surprisingly good. And uh, like I said before, learn the basics and then study some uh, Nintendo files or the save file. Like, if you have my save file, which if you buy my own online, it comes with it, you can look at all of my data. And you can be like, oh, that is how I made that note. He used a table the script and he did that pitch bend there. And oh, that's cool. I never thought of that. And I trade safe files with people all the time, and I learn those from them. So I don't know. It's, it's a cool way to share your music to get it a little bit more in depth than just listening to a track. And then, if all else fails, you should do fake bit music, right, Rich? No. <laughs> What's fake? Man, I'm just trying to start. So the thing about fake bit music is people will use sequencers or uh, regular modern synthesizers to make sounds that sound like fake music. And what's cool about that is no one cares. Like, you can, if you have a good track, no one's going to be like, well, it would have been sweet if you did that on Game Boy, but, you know. <laughs> like, there's no elitism. Um, there's just bonus points when you have sweet pro. There's a little bit. <laughs> there, there really is that. Um, like, there's a guy played today at uh, Mr. Chris. He played the first day, and he had, it was all fake good stuff, and it was fantastic. And you can also do a lot of things that you can't do. Can, you can kind of, uh, you know, use real drums if you want to do that, or you can uh, use regular synthesizer, and you can really mix stuff. You don't have to do just chip music. Like, I've been showing you a lot of stuff that's very pure chip music, but that's one of the cool things about the genre, is you can really do anything you want with it. It's just a sound aesthetic that you can add to any other kind of music. Um, if I had to recommend anything, I would recommend Flow the Chip Sounds. It's a software synthesizer or a soft synth. If you guys are familiar with that, it's really, really accurate and really good and made by a good indie company, um, but do not ever, ever, ever use GSXCC. So, if any of you have ever seen a video on YouTube, it's like, enter Sam, man, eat bit. <laughs> no one's seen this. Oh, yeah, everyone has seen this. Yeah, and it, it, it pisses me off, because it always has like 100,000 views, and people are like, this is sick boss music. But what it is, is somebody stole a MIDI from a person who actually took the time to compose this MIDI, which is that person actually gets some props but they, they just steal it, and then they run it through this stupid synthesizer, and it has like the chintziest, shittiest 8-bit sound I've ever heard in my life. The drums are terrible. The sounds don't even sound like 8-bit stuff. Seriously, when I hear like an understanding cover on, on YouTube or something, if I compose that on a Game Boy or something like that, I can make it sound a thousand times better, a thousand times easier. Oh my god. <laughs> Someone go say that. And it, it, to me, you know, I mean, I have kind of a trained ear, but it sounds awful. And all the people using it, like, it's literally just input file, export file, oh, and now I learned it. And it's, it's seriously, like, insulting to me as an artist when people use it. And it sounds bad, but it's hopeful that understanding 8-bit has 100,000 views and people are all about it. When if they heard a real awesome tune track, they'd be like, hey, wait a minute, this is amazing. And if people think that shitty stuff is amazing, I think there's so much room for tune music to grow in like, the modern uh, just music world. So there is a little bit of room. Anyways, you don't have, uh, if you do end up doing fake bit stuff, you don't have the same limitations that like, you don't have the channel limitations. Um, and so you can do more stuff with it in terms of like, you can use more notes at the same time. 
but a lot of times they use a little bit simpler sound design because they don't think to do all these crazy workarounds which give us the same character. Uh, I'm not saying it's worse or anything, but I tend to hear a little bit simpler sound design out of uh, fake stuff. So pay attention when you're doing it. So let's say you guys want to play shows. Um, it can actually be hard to play shows because, like I said, people, I tell them I play the game more than I always play. Um, but try to play with maybe like industrial arts or electronic scene or maybe indie rap. I really haven't found anything that works at all. <laughs> Which is kind of depressing, but some stuff, I don't know, they either love it or they hate it. And it is a little boring. Have you played a lot of shows like outside of chip music? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm surprised that you've had such bad experiences with it because of, I mean, maybe it's because like we do vocal pop music with Game Boy stuff, so the audience is already used to hearing that, but there's like not really much translation between like a chip music dance duo and like a just electronic music. But you can find it. Oh, oh yeah. Maybe it's just my city of Buffalo is terrible. <laughs> it's very possible. Um, but a lot of people say, what do I do on stage? Like, I have a game board. Like, what am I doing over here? Yeah. And the trick is, is just sell it. Like, you just get up on stage, do fist pump, and it doesn't matter if you feel like an idiot. It's like, you just own that game board, and people will love you. I saw this. This like four foot tall Zen Albatross dude take a bunch of photos. <laughs> and like, he was just on stage with his Game Boy playing the sweetest jams ever. And I saw college bros, like, it was only them. And they, at the end of the set, were in love with this guy. So I, I felt the magic of chip music that night. It's actually one of the reasons I started playing. So I was like, this is amazing. Visuals, too. Oh, yeah. I forgot to bring up visuals. Thank you. Tell me about visuals. Well, sometimes, I mean, it, it can be difficult to watch a guy on stage playing a Game Boy, so usually we bring in some sort of high fluent visualist to like make some crazy background stuff that's going on at the same time. So there's, there's been a, uh, an awesome overlap in like the visual arts community, uh, utilizing a lot of the same techniques that we as Game Boy musicians would use. They just apply that to graphics. Um, let's see, who guys? Mike Goodman down here. Mike Goodman over here. Peter Baca. He uh, he has like circuit bent uh, Ness. Nintendo with any system, but literally he's in there like physically manipulating the hardware with like these, these like contacts and like shorting things out and getting these really like, deaf, like messed up things going on screen. But it's a lot it's a lot cooler than watching me on stage pressing start and like left and right. <laughs> yeah, like, have you ever watched someone play a video game? Imagine not being able to see the screen. <laughs> But anyways, if any of you, you know, I mean, I'm focusing a little bit on the inspiring chip artist, but like, if you're an audience member, like, chip music is totally fun, and you need to dance and embrace the, and help these people out, because it can be intimidating being one guy on stage, so just dance and have a good time, help us out, please. Just throwing that out. And I, I have a couple of things you should do, okay? First is, you need to watch this documentary called Three Full Magic Land. Um, it was done by the two player productions guys. Anybody know who that is? They did the first season of uh, Penny Arcade series. In fact, they did this and then Penny Arcade called them up to move out here to do that. Um, and they had trouble showing these places. It was a chip tune documentary and it was amazing. And when they brought it out, they were like, oh, you guys do really good work. I will give you some work. And you should watch it. It's, it's actually free on Hulu, but you should buy it anyways because they're sweet. And actually, you guys know the Double Fine Adventure? That those guys are actually uh, doing that documentary as well. So if you donated to that, you just gave them the money to drink for stall. Because what are they going to use all that money? <laughs> That's one of the guests. The other thing is you should go to Book Fest. Book Fest is a chicken festival in New York, but they also have them in Tokyo and Australia. And was there a European one? Yeah? Okay. So it's this like three day. Um, festival of chip music and it's fantastic. It, it, like, it blew my mind. I went not really knowing all that much. Well, I did know a lot, but I didn't really know anybody. I did know five people there and I made like a thousand friends afterwards. And a lot of them knew who I was because uh, I had listed my tracks online. It's like this amazing community of musicians and it's a fantastic festival. It's in New York uh, this May, I want to say, May 25th. Memorial Day weekend. Oh, tickets went on sale today? Oh, well, you should totally buy tickets for that and go, because it's fantastic. And then the other thing you should do is go to the chip show tomorrow. 
and Jamstrix, and love them, and the two being. Because I can just talk about chiptunes all day, but it's more fun to actually go to a chiptune concert, I assure you. So I'm going to do some cheap plugs here. This is sweet. I have my own three or three to five every week because they're going to kick me out of this room eventually. In fact, I have like two minutes left. Um, I'm playing a date in Brooklyn next week. If you guys didn't come to it, that would be awesome. I'm playing with a fantastic, fantastic artist. It's seriously like a stacked line. Um, and then I'm going on tour with the Herman Car Club. You guys over there? Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you, guys. And uh, we're doing uh, five or six days. We're doing, I found out this is Wooster. 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 Yeah. That blew my mind. By the way. <laughs> and then uh, we're doing Philly, or this kind of like outer Philly suburb, I think. Uh, Montreal, Toronto, and then Buffalo. And then they're actually doing a couple days after that. But uh, you should totally come out to those shows, please. Come say hi to me, ask me questions about chip music, anything. Anyone have any questions? Because I have just come in this left. What's up? Hurry, run. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> the switch. Yeah, oh, wow. So you guys played a lot of Nintendo music and sound effects for us. Do you ever use the sound effects in your music or remix Nintendo songs, or is that considered an uncool and unoriginal? Um, I do it, but um, there are some people who um, aren't so much in the remix community. Um, but for me, like it's all good. Like good music is good music. Like. So can I find chiptune music on OC Remix, for example? Oh yeah, there's um, tons of chiptune stuff on there. There's some controversy we're not going to get into it because it's old, but there's a ton of songs that utilize chiptune technique. And you also mentioned the Commodore 64. Do you guys use the Apple II? What was that? You, do you use the Apple II in addition to the Commodore 64? Eight bit weapon. You, you were in the shirt. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I was going to tell you about it. I was going to tell you about it, but obviously you know. They're awesome. Yeah, they're awesome. And their Apple IIe stuff is probably the best. Or the only. <laughs> People make Apple IIe? Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, man. People blow up on all the time. And do you know anything about this upcoming documentary called 8-Bit Generation? I don't. It's not even out yet, but I heard the new chip to the documentary. I am not going to it. We're not in it. I'll take one more question. Um, I apologize, guys. We're not going to use my time. Okay, we can talk out in the hall as much as you want. Give me one more question. You guys talked about this before about how you find a cool sound and you have a bass track. What I was kind of wondering was when you go to the right track, do you have something in your head? And what I find is why I think it's difficult. It is difficult. That sound. That's why, you know, I learned a lot of music theory and the better I get at it, the more I can take the ideas from my head um, and put them into musical things. Like now, I know what a animated sound for sounds like. I'm like, oh, that's, that would go well there. I can totally hear that. And the other thing is, I really, really understand the limitations of what I can and cannot do. So, once you really, really understand both music and your, uh, your instrument, like fully, then you can come up with ideas in your head and say, like, oh, I can do this, or I can't do that. And it really helps focus your ideas towards the uh, goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys.